Hey there, Vernacular Faithful. Redcoat here. And Sienter joins in. And we're going to be doing another interview today. Uh, today, I'll be talking to Sientir about his experience with modding in StarCraft. Yeah, so just to give some background, uh, quite a number of years ago now, 2004-ish, I want to say, 2003, in that sort of area, I really got into the modding community for StarCraft Brood War, and uh, I quite enjoyed that. Some background is that at that point in time, all of this was done through sort of external means. People would basically hack apart the data files for StarCraft and modify them. And that, that's how you did modding, is you literally modified the, the data files, which you can still do with StarCraft Brood War. Not with StarCraft Remastered, because of the way that it checks and verifies things. I've, I've checked this to see if I could run my mods and no, and I'd have... Anyway, that's kind of going off the side. Um, in the years that followed, Blizzard did a lot to try to implement some of those modding functionalities directly into their world editor type program. Uh, so StarCraft II actually has a very robust set of first-party modding tools mm -hmm. uh, and, and first-party support for modding. But that grew out of StarCraft Brood War and all of the support from a third-party sense for modding that game. So, with your experience with modding StarCraft, were there any things that you felt that you, uh, you picked up from doing that? Uh, for sure. One of the big things with modding is it allows you to have sort of an experience you're familiar with, right? Like, both of us have experienced designing games, and one of the things that happens is you, like, have to build everything from scratch. Yeah. And then you kind of get to the phase where you're doing balancing and polishing and tweaking and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, with an already existing environment that you get from modding, you have a foundation and an understanding to work from. You don't have to build up that understanding as you're making a thing. So that allows you to be able to kind of tweak things and kind of work from a base of understanding. When you're making your own game, you don't know what balance should even look like yet. Mm -hmm. And when you're modding a game, you have a presentation of what balance should look like. So it allows you to be able to explore what your thoughts on what balance could look like in that game. So that's something that's really interesting. Okay. Now, I was pretty new to any sort of game design concept when I was modding. So this was an area where, well, both modding StarCraft and making maps in Warcraft 3, that I was really able to kind of explore balance in, in a sort of a sandbox environment uh, where I could take a pre-existing idea, particularly with StarCraft, um, because I had is modifying just the pre-existing way that the game worked, and I could mess with that and try to figure out what could I do, how could I tweak the game to play differently. But you have a limited way that you can adjust it, right? And you have a foundation that you're working from, right. which, which means that you can have that base to build off of. Okay. So you'd say that it, it simplifies certain aspects of, of designing a product in that you don't, have to, you, don't have to learn, you don't have to learn from bare points what your product even is. You, you kind of already know because you've played it, uh, and you're just looking to, to change the experience in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, it's really about taking an experience you know and love and saying, I wonder what it would be like if it worked differently somehow. So, with that in mind, what do you feel like you learned from, from doing that? That's an interesting question. I think one of the important things is understanding what makes an environment actually work. Uh, this is kind of an interesting thing to kind of work through, but for anybody who has played uh, the StarCraft style of RTS, um, that's a game that's kind of big on what I'm going to call sort of like soft counters isn't quite the right way to phrase it, mm. but sort of a lot of RTSs that I've played otherwise have a lot of units that can be very murky in terms of what, what their role do. is or where they're presented as being very specific hard counters to specific things. Uh, what comes to mind is Age of Mythology, for example, because that's an RTS that I've played more recently, where you have like your standard infantry, and then you have the guys that are supposed to be good against infantry, and then you have, like, your myth units, and, and heroes that are supposed to be good against myth units, and, like, there's this sort of, like, interplay of, like, strengths and weaknesses that is inherent in the design of the game. Yeah. Whereas something like StarCraft, uh, the way that that unit design works is this is a unit, this is what it does, and then the natural flow of that is certain things are good against that unit, certain things, certain things are weak against that unit. So... For example, zealots are very powerful melee fighters, which means that 
certain types of terrain can cause some serious problems because they can't attack up a cliff, for example, mm -hmm. or down a cliff. They have to navigate around. But it also means they can't do anything about air units. So while they can potentially be very powerful on the ground, they can be good at holding the line and that sort of thing, they're going to be completely worthless against, say, a wraith. Okay. Which is a flying unit. So you say it gave you a better understanding of that, that concept of, you know, how how the balance works in that uh, in that scenario and what things work against what you'd say? or um, So, yeah, to kind of get to that question, it gave me an opportunity to play around with this sort of idea of how do you set up counterplay okay. in non-explicit ways. It really, using my greater level of experience that I now have, yeah. I can kind of look at it and say, what I'm really talking about is how do I build things with strengths and weaknesses, um, and then create things to exploit those weaknesses that have their own weaknesses. Yeah, so it's kind of like how Magic's, uh, Magic's color system was uh, originally designed. Yeah, so like how white is really good at answering things, but all the answers are specific, so if you don't draw the right answer, it creates problems. Or there's also very limited card draw in white, so you might have all of the answers, but somebody can run you out of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's similar to that in, in concept, or like red has no good way of dealing with enchantments. Yeah, so it's like there's, it's the idea of building a, building an archetype, but not necessarily expressly stating that this archetype works against another, but because you've built the archetype, you have ways of exploiting that, and you can build that into other things. Yeah, so for example, uh, you might, in a mod, make carriers even more ridiculous against ground units, but mm -hmm. you might really nerf their anti-air capabilities. So it's like, oh, you see a group of carriers, they're going to launch their interceptors, they're going to wreck your base, but if you get a couple of, like, wraiths or some other anti-air unit, Valkyries or whatever, mm -hmm. they can just go in there and clean them up, and there's nothing that the carriers can really do effectively because they don't have enough damage to take them out. Okay. Um, like, they might be able to attack them so they can, like, fend off, like, a lone thing, but an actual, like, squadron, they can't do anything to Mm -hmm. So there's just different ways of saying, hmm, okay, I can try this sort of thing, or I can try that sort of thing. Or even just exploring different ideas, like air units are very powerful in StarCraft because they aren't restricted by terrain, mm -hmm. as you would expect. They can fly over everything. So I made a mod where the only air units were dropships, basically. Mm -hmm. Things that could pick up and drop units. And this changes how the game plays. The goal of it was to make the map layout more relevant. Mm. Because it definitely starts off relevant, but in a more casual play style, where you tend to just hack to air and then mass a bunch of air units, the train eventually becomes irrelevant and just becomes kind of a, a, it's a square. It's just the map, whatever. Yeah. That was an attempt to let's emphasize a certain thing. Were there problems with it? Yeah. For one thing, it certainly caused weird stuff with the engine at times. Mm -hmm. Not the most robust engine at at, the, at that period. You can push it so far, right? And, and then once you start pushing a little bit further, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. But, you know, it creates this interesting experience where the way that the units behave uh, and how you're trying to do things works differently and what counterplay looks like is different and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to claim that, that was the most successful mod. But it was something that you tried. Yeah. Definitely the one that I ended up liking the most I called Age of Exploration, and that was the idea that bases would be really cheap and quick to set up, and everything was... It was a faster pace of play, and the units were a lot more expendable and stuff like that. And I certainly enjoyed playing around with that, but there was also harder counters in that. Like, Corsairs were absolutely ridiculous because they shot in a big AoE around them, mm -hmm. which meant that they could tear through huge swarms of stuff. Still couldn't attack ground, though, so, you know, you could roll up with your hydra lists and push the corsairs out. But it's just the idea of... Rea it, it made the game more immediately reactionary because you could see what the opponent was doing and it was really easy to mass something. And you could respond to that by trying to build a composition to counter it and it was very quick response time as opposed to uh, the sort of... I'm not going to call it slow, but slower pace of play that StarCraft mm -hmm. normally has. Okay. So, with you working to mod a lot of, mod various things into and out of the game, what else did you learn, um, would you say, from that? The value of exploring with stuff and just pursuing ideas, you know, it's, it's easy to start at the very simple stage. What happens if you give a Marine 30 shields, right? And how does that change the, the game? 
but you can then start hitting upon interesting ideas and interesting concepts. I mentioned Agent of Exploration, and one of the things in that mod is the way that Zerglings worked. So there's this weird armor type um, in the game that makes you take, like, a half point of damage from any damage source. Hmm. Like, you always take that amount, but you only take that amount. And the result of this is that I, I gave this to Zerglings, I gave them the natural HP regen that Zergs have, and then I gave them, like, 4 HP or something. Mm -hmm. They would not survive a group, but single high damage sources were ineffective against them mm. uh, because they would just regenerate it. Yeah. So you needed a bunch of fast damage sources, and you could just chew, chew through them like they weren't there, like tissue paper. Yeah. But they were, like, this weird, almost, like, cornstarch sort of thing where if you hit it hard enough, it's like a friggin' wall, but if you, like... It gently push all your fingers to it, there's just like goose right through it. Huh, okay. Uh, the the non-Newtonian fluid there. But it's just, it's interesting because that sort of process of exploration allows you to hit upon ideas that allow things to be able to play in specific ways. Mm -hmm. And that option of seeing what can I do, how can I push this box, what mechanical space can I explore within the confines of what I'm presented with, mm -hmm. is I think really useful as a, as a game design tool and saying, where can I push the boundaries? Uh, what can I mess with? And I think that kind of speaks to who I am as a designer in general. Mm -hmm. I tend to prefer having some sort of structured environment that I can then begin exploring the limits of. Yeah. So would you say that in doing this, you kind of developed a, uh, developed a design intuition? I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. It's certainly... It's hard to look back at something that you did goodness, a decade and a half ago, and say what lessons you took from it. Certainly, it's one of those things where I can look back and sort of analyze what I was doing. I think what it did was it more laid a foundation for how I approach game design and how I approach thinking about these sorts of things. And it's one of those things where I can learn more from it, looking back on it almost, than what I learned from it at the time, if that makes sense. Okay. So you said you did modding for StarCraft, and you also dabbled a little bit with StarCraft II. Uh, what would you consider to be the main differences between the two of those? So StarCraft II is structured very differently in how you mod it and also how the game works. StarCraft I... There's, there's, so there's a fundamental uh, similarity in that you just have a bunch of stat blocks, but the way that things are linked together is a little bit different. Um, I mean, it's, it's more... Refined, I guess you could say, in StarCraft II because it's a much later game. But sort of the possibilities of what you can do are broader in StarCraft II, mm. but also more convoluted in a way. Because of the... I, I want to say more advanced, perhaps more refined mm. uh, game structure. The other thing, too, is that I was coming at them slightly differently. With StarCraft II, I had specific things that I was really interested in exploring. Mm. Uh, one of the things that a lot of RTS games do is they have kind of this research backbone, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Uh, where if you, I mean, especially if you look at like the Age of games, like Age of Vampires, Age of Mythology, that sort of thing. Uh, the there's a Star Wars variant on those as well. Those games all have like here's a giant pile of things you can research to upgrade your units from like stormtroopers to stormtroopers with better guns to stormtroopers with better armor or whatever. Yeah. Um, now, I will say I appreciate about StarCraft that the upgrades are all very transparent about what they do and why you want them. But just this idea of the end game state being identical, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it really got me interested in the idea of what happens if you have to make decisions about how you advance in gameplay. So I was definitely interested in trying to explore that with StarCraft 2. Mm -hmm. And giving it a little bit of that civilization flavor. Yeah... I mean, kind of. The, well, the thing is with, like, Civ, at least Civ Five, which is the one that I've played, Yeah. you kind of, you have your different civilizations, so that's kind of similar to playing, like, Protoss here in Zerg. Yeah. And sort of your end state is everything anyway. Oh, yeah? Okay. Like, I mean, this is, this is fundamentally an issue with, like, Dark Souls as well, if we go into that, where the end state is have all the things. Yeah. Like, even in, in Dark Souls... Like, Dark Souls 2 is perhaps the most egregious for this, because you get so much experience, you can get so many levels so quickly, where you reach the mid-500s, 
and at that point you soft capped everything. This is kind of there's a certain type of, of design where the end state becomes identical. So it's the interstitial states where there's variance. Mm -hmm. And I prefer systems where the end state is variant. Uh, Guild Wars 1 works that way, for example. Pokemon works that way. Yeah. Uh, anything where you have to make trade-offs. So what I was interested in is how could I pursue a system that had trade-offs where the end state was not going to be identical every time. Yeah. Where getting this upgrade meant that this unit worked this way, and getting this upgrade meant it worked a different way. And the upgrades were mutually exclusive. You cannot get both. Okay. And so that's something that I was certainly exploring some in the modding. Interestingly enough, Age of Mythology does do this with which god you choose to follow, presenting you a different myth unit, a different god power, and some unique upgrades to that deity. Yeah. Which I think is a very interesting idea and something that I'd like to see explored further. Uh, but this is just kind of... When I was going to modding StarCraft 2, I was coming at it with a certain sort of approach where I wasn't asking, what can I do with this system? It's, how does this design philosophy play out? Mm. The problem with it is, while I could certainly set that up, and I was, uh, I was making some pretty good progress on doing that with the Protoss, the fundamental issue is the AI aspect. And setting up the AI to be able to play with those properly is um, something I wasn't able to quite figure out. So the StarCraft One modding was a little bit more limited in that you couldn't change the buttons without hacking mm -hmm. the executable. And, and you can certainly do that. Like, there were tools to make hacked versions or patched versions of the StarCraft executable. But the buttons were hard-coded, weirdly enough. There were some weird things like attack buttons could show up for certain units that didn't natively have them. Yeah. But for the most part, like, Psionic Storm was hard-coded to be a skill that the, heart, that the High Templar had. And you couldn't add it onto something else. So what modding in StarCraft 1 was like was a lot of tweaks. So you could change things like appearances. You could change things like movement speeds and what guns things had and... Uh, how many how many shields they had and hit points and all sorts of like things, so you could change basically a lot of the statistics, but you couldn't change certain functionality. Yeah, you couldn't change the core the the core nature of whatever item you were you were uh, yeah. changing. Yeah, like the marine unit would always have that. You couldn't change the tech tree especially or any of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Starcraft two is much more data driven, so you can change like all of that stuff. Okay. Um, but the issue is the AI doesn't understand what changes you've made. Per se. Uh -huh. And it didn't in StarCraft 1 either, um, but basically what I'm saying is modding a StarCraft 2, unless you know how to mod the AI, is going to run into the same restriction that StarCraft 1 ran into, where effectively you could only really modify the existing units um, and hope the AI is using them properly. Okay. Well, yeah, that's all very, very interesting. So, hmm, excuse me. So with modding the with modding these games and I mean obviously you've played them a little bit as well I assume yeah yeah uh, would you consider yourself more of a more of a player of the games or more of a modder of the games? Um, I would definitely consider myself more of a modder for StarCraft One. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you're always having to play with the mods, but I I prefer playing modded StarCraft One than uh, vanilla StarCraft One mm -hmm. for StarCraft Two. Um, I'm more of a player. I haven't played in a while, but that game, for one thing, receives enough updates mm -hmm. uh, that some of the impetus for modding is lesser. Yeah. Um, because part of what makes modding interesting is the game experiences, for lack of a better phrase, gotten stale to some extent. Yeah. And uh, you want to try something else. Like, what if scouts were actually a good unit? Uh, apparently... Uh, from watching some of the StarCraft One remastered tournaments, the Scout, which is a Protoss air unit, is not worth the mineral cost to make it. Huh. So it's it's considered a useless unit. Anyway, so just sort of the idea of what if the balance was different is a more interesting question of StarCraft One. Yeah. And also, I was at a different point in. Uh, my development as a designer. Yeah. I didn't have a lot of the tools that I have now to kind of explore my design creativity. To explore it in a, in a theoretical space. Yeah. Like, 
the way that I could explore my design creativity uh, back in the day was making StarCraft maps, StarCraft mods, and WarCraft 3 maps. Mm -hmm. And that, that was kind of the way that I would explore my game designer stuff. So, like, there would be stuff to talk about with Warcraft 3 as well, just mm -hmm. because of the, the robustness of the custom map system in that game. Um, okay. So, I feel like a lot of the, a lot of the stuff you've learned with, uh, with working with StarCraft and uh, StarCraft 2, at least the modding space of it, um, I feel like a lot of those could actually uh, carry over to other, to other genres. Would you say that? Yeah, for sure. Like, I've been sort of poking at an RPG that I've been making an RPG maker, and just sort of the idea of, this is a very rigid engine in some respects. Yeah. Uh, and what can I do with this? I mean, to some extent, it feels like I'm modding that engine when I'm making plugins for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to figure out how I can make relevant mechanical space, it's, it's similar to uh, trying to make sure that the units all have a purpose. Yeah. Right? And in Age of Exploration, that, that mod, I was wanting to try to figure out how to express certain mechanical ideas. And that sort of tweaking design where you do something, you play with it, you see how you're responding to it as a player, and then that causes you to go back and think, as a designer, how should I approach this? Mm -hmm. That is a mentality, and that's part of who I am as a designer, but just getting a sense for how to understand how I'm responding to things as a player and sort of that self-feedback loop mm. of saying, okay, what sort of experience am I having? Is it doing what I want? And this wouldn't be how I was thinking of it necessarily when I was working on Age of Exploration because, I mean, frankly, I'm a much more refined designer at this point. One would hope that a decade and a half has done something. Well, one would hope. <laughs> yeah, but just that that intuitive process of no, this isn't quite working right, or this is being too powerful, or this needs counterplay. There's a sort of an intuitive element of, of when you play a game, and sort of that tweaking process it helps develop the your instinct for for learning those sorts of things. Yeah, and also the need to like. Understanding that you need to test all the different aspects as well. Yeah. Do you have anything to kind of wrap this up, do you think? Yeah, so just a, a final sort of word. I think modding is a really useful thing to be able to have in games because it gives people an area to play with something that they understand and to begin developing their game designer skills. So for my fellow game developers out there, if it's possible for you to set up modding tools for your game to provide them for the outside community of players, I would recommend doing so because that will help provide basically a way to develop the next generation of game designers. It will provide opportunities and tools for people who love your game to learn more how your game works and to be able to create and explore and it will give them an opportunity to begin building their, their foundation for, for game design and game development work. So they are something that gives back to the community in a very interesting, forward-looking way. So I would highly recommend people who are interested in game design as well to pick a game that has the ability to mod that you'd like to explore modding and do that. Like, you can develop game design sensibilities that way because a lot of the sensibilities can transfer to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, so... I mean, it's the same thing as, like, making custom magic cards. It's the same idea, and actually playing with them and trying to refine them and that sort of thing. Doing those sorts of exercises with an existing game, modifying an existing game, is a really good way of building... Building that understanding of balance and the concept of design identities. Yeah, and, uh, and directional iteration and all that sort of stuff. So Yeah. Uh, well, I feel like we've gone over a lot of this one here. Yeah, I think so. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and head to the sign-off. But first, let's check what our next thing is going to be here. I believe... So next time, we are going to begin talking about competitive environments. Yeah, it's going to be a bit of a deep dive. Uh, so, you know, put on your seat belts and stuff. But, yeah, it's one of the ones that we spend a lot of time on. Uh, figuring out when well, we spend a lot of time on a lot of these. But <laughs> It's true. 
But yeah, so go ahead and tune in next time, and we'll be talking about the first uh, part one of our examination of competitive environments. Yep. Understanding them. Yeah. So, with that, we're going to head to the sign-off. This is CN here, signing off. And this is Redcoat, signing off. Play the games you want to play, boyos.